Please welcome Kyle, who's going to talk to us about P tableaus and chromatic symmetric functions. Thanks, Aaron. I'm going to talk about P tableau and chromatic symmetric functions. This might be not the longest talk you've ever seen, but it's going to be a fun time. Um, so this is sort of the background stuff towards what I'm currently working on. Um, I don't have a million results for what I've been working on recently, so that's going to be next semester. But this is all of the background information that you'll need to understand what I'm talking about next year. Um, so, alright, we've seen a lot of these definitions before, but let's redefine them again. I mean, who's going to go back and watch the last YouTube talk? All of our subscribers. Um, let's let P be a poset. Um, we're going to define the incompatibility graph. of P, called inc of P. Uh, it has a vertex set, just defined by elements of your post set, and an edge between uh, elements x and y, if they are incomparable in your post set. So if x and y are incomparable, we get uh, an edge in the graph, and we'll have a couple of graphs later down the line to see some examples of that. Uh, first, the chromatic symmetric function part of this, uh, given a graph G, the chromatic symmetric function of G, which we'll write x sub G, is the sum over all proper colorings um, of these monomials, where you just keep track of how many times you use each color. elements whether they could be compared because like I think so, yeah, are yeah. like if they're less than or greater than then they're comparable and if they're not they're incomparable yeah those words get and, and your abbreviation after that is still correct right yes. in so it's, yeah that's all good it's, yes they're yeah. incomparable yeah not incomparable <laughs> um so this is our definition of the chromatic chromatic symmetric function we've seen examples of these back in the day but we're going to use some high powered theorems to sort of look at this today um, in particular, I'll remind you the Stanley Stembridge conjecture, which was made in 1993. Um, so this is a symmetric function, which means we can express it in all of our favorite bases of symmetric functions. Um, the conjecture is, it's not stated exactly like this, but this is um, a similar I think this implies the original Stanley Stanbridge conjecture. Um, if P is a 3 plus 1 free poset, which means you don't have an induced sub poset that is isomorphic to that. So this is the poset 3 plus 1. So if my poset doesn't contain that as an induced sub poset, then if I take the chromatic symmetric function, of the incomparability graph of P is E positive. So if I express the symmetric function in the elementary symmetric function basis, um, it is expanded with positive coefficients, positive integer, or I think it's integer for this, but not always. Um, so this is I don't know, middle-aged as far as like mathematical open questions go. You know, there's open <laughs> questions that date back to the 1800s that we've never solved, and there's open questions that were formulated yesterday. So this is like, you know, somewhere in the middle of it. Um, but um, Richard Stanley, you know, he defined the chromatic symmetric functions, and people were really interested in them right away. Um, and there were some results that came somewhat quickly. So one the theorem to Grav Sharav in the year of my birth, 1996. 
uh, found that, okay, we haven't proven that they're E positive, but they're almost as good, they are S positive. So, if the poset is three plus one three, then the incomparability graph X of G is positive when expanded in the sure basis. So we're gonna write this positive. Um, something from symmetric function theory, so um, E positive, if a, if a symmetric function is E positive, uh, that implies that it is S positive, but not necessarily the other way. It's not an implication. So having S positive does not give us that it's E positive. But it makes sense. If we want something to be E positive, then it better also be S positive. And so if we found that it wasn't S positive, that would be a problem. Um, furthermore, this is like an aside, Um, this was proven combinatorially, so we actually can count what the coefficients are going to be, which is why they're positive integer coefficients. Um, so we're going to get the chromatic symmetric function of the incomparability graph is the sum over partitions lambda of n, where n is the number of elements in your poset, equivalently the number of vertices in the graph, of c lambda times the sure function s lambda, where c lambda is the number of p tableau of shape lambda. So I haven't defined p tableau yet, I'm gonna do that in a second. Um, but this is sort of where this proof came from. We're counting a number of things, um, and so if the coefficient is a count, then they're always going to be positive, or at least non-negative integer coefficients. You might have zero p tableau of a certain shape. Yes? Is there any, like, how should I think about three plus one free posets? Are those natural in some sense, or is it easy to show that the conjecture is false if you do have one of those? Um, it, yeah, I think it is easy to show, like, mm -hmm. if you consider this poset, uh -huh. and take the incomparability graph, which is the claw graph, so, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is um, a graph whose chromatic symmetric function is not E-positive. Um, I don't have exactly the expansion right now. I did it at one point. Okay, cool. Um, I could yes. look back and notes and find it. Um, the other thing that, uh, another way to think about this is instead of building up a graph from a poset, we could um, just think about graphs themselves. And so I think the Stanley Stanbridge conjecture was originally stated for unit interval graphs, um, which are graphs that can be formed as the intersection graph of a bunch of unit intervals in the, you know, in the real line. So if I have the real line, let's maybe put an interval here an interval here, an interval here, and maybe one down here. I'm just sort of stretching them up, but all of these you can imagine on the line and intersecting each other. If this is like A, B, C, and D. Then my intersection graph has A intersects B, but not C or D, and then B, C, and D form a clique. And so, the fact that we are three plus one avoiding means that this can't show up in my unit interval graph, and that makes sense. There's no way to have unit intervals where I have sort of a central one that touches three others, but none of the three others touch each other, because they're all length one, right? So this is a bad picture because you know, they'll have to overlap. Oh, cool. Thanks. So that's another way to think about it. Um, in fact, the conjecture, so a unit interval graph comes from a three plus one free and a two plus two free poset. Um, that's because we can't have this show up as the intersection graph of these things either. Um, but the conjecture was strengthened. If it's three plus one free, then it's also three plus one and two plus two free. 
Um, so that's a way of thinking about these graphs. Thanks. Any other questions so far? Okay. Um, so, oh, I feel like I was going to say something before I talked about ketone. Well, too late. Okay, so let's define what a P tableau is. So let P be both set. Um, a P tableau of shape lambda is a filling of the Young diagram of lambda. Seth showed us Young diagrams last week. How kind. Um, with entries of P such that the two following conditions hold. Um, in rows, um, consecutive elements have to be increasing according to P. Um, so adjacent entries increase with respect to the ordering of the bow set. And we need something a little bit weaker for columns. As you go up a column, um, adjacent en entries are just non-decreasing. Does that allow for incomparable elements? Yes, so incomparable elements can go in any order in a column. Um, so one um, corollary of this, or I guess a very simple example, um, if P is a chain, so if P looks like you know n, n minus 1, all the way down to two and one, so a totally ordered set, then the set of P tableau is the same thing as the set of standard tableau. Can you raise both? Um, no, I think so. So a standard tableau has rows increasing and columns increasing. Oh, standard. 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 Not semi standard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got gotcha. um, Exactly. Um, we're also going to be filling our tableau with each entry only once. Um, so, in that case, uh, semi standard reduces to standard. Okay, so let's do a big example to sort of get our hands around what's going on. Um, the other thing, so all of these um, things that I just erased, these 3 plus 1 free posets, you can construct using Hessenberg vectors, which is how they connect back to Hessenberg varieties. Um, this is something I talked a little bit more about in the fall, and I'm going to sort of skip over today. However, I am going to label this example with a Hessenberg vector for my own satisfaction. <laughs> Okay, so there's some way of turning Hessenberg vectors into posets, but you can black box that and just assume we're starting with this poset. So I have five elements. I have one is less than three, four, and five. Two is less than four and five. And three, four, and five are all incomparable. Um, one thing I'll note. This has a max chain length of two. So there's no chains longer than length two in this post set because I mean all the things on the top are um, maximal elements. Um, okay, what is the incomparability graph gonna look like? Well, 
it's almost like taking the, I guess in this case it might just be taking the complement of the diagram. Um, so one is incomparable to two, two is incomparable to three, three is incomparable to four and five, and four and five are incomparable. So one goes to two, goes to three, goes to four, goes to five, and three and five are incomparable. So, we're going to be considering the chromatic uh, symmetric function of this graph. And let's, instead of counting colorings, we have Gosharov's result, which tells us how to count them using these p-tableau. So, one thing to note in rows, adjacent entries have to be increasing according to the diagram of the POSET. In particular, that tells us that rows of a p-tableau corresponds to chains in p. Because they have to be increasing. So if I start with a 2 in a row, it has to be followed by a 5 or a 4. Um, I can't put incomparable elements there. And so, um, let's put Gosharov's result back up here. xg is the, I guess, x sub algorithm p, uh, is the sum of c lambda, s lambda, lambda is a partition of n, c lambda is the number of p tableau of shape lambda. Let's list out all of our partitions of uh, the number 5. So we have 5, uh, 4, comma, 1, 3, comma, 2, 3, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 1, 1, 1, and all 1s. And these, unlike sets tableau, correspond to row lengths. So the partition 5 is a row of length 5. The partition 11111 is five rows of length one. Um, okay, but if rows of a p tableau correspond to chains in our poset, then a row of length five can't be filled in using this poset because I don't have a chain of length five. In fact, if my max chain length is two, that tells me I only have to look at partitions that have um, a largest part size of two. So right away, all of these coefficients of these sure functions will be zero because there's no way to get a p tableau with this poset. So we have three shapes to consider. We have two two one, two one one one, and the column of all ones. Okay, let's do one of these together, and then you'll trust me on the other two. Uh, so for two two one. Let's just think about how we could fill this in from this poset, satisfying these two conditions. So again, rows correspond to chains. So for each of my two rows of length two, I'm going to have to pick some chains. So maybe for the first row, we pick the chain one, three. And for the second row, we pick the chain two, five. So one, three, two, five. And then because 1 and 2 are incomparable, and 3 and 5 are incomparable, our column condition is happy. We haven't decreased going up the column. And then we have to plop that 4 up here. That's fine, because 2 is non-decreasing up to 4. Um, so it turns out there's going to be 8 of these. Um, let me write them all down for you. So we're going to have 1, 3, 2, 4, 5. One, three, two, five, four. One, four, two, five, three. One, five, two, four, three. Um, the other thing to note, one and two are incomparable. And so I could go two and then one in the column. That's perfectly fine. So I could do something like two, four, one, three, five. Also, 4 and 3 are incomparable, so this is still fine. Um, 2, 5, 1, 3, 4. 
two, five, one, four, three, and two, four, one, five, three. So these are, in fact, all eight uh, P tableau of shape two, two, one using this post set P. So just eight of them. And there's going to be 14 of these and um, 24 of these. So at the end of the day, we're going to find that our chromatic symmetric function is 8 s2 2 1s, 14 s2 1 1 1, and 24 s 1 1 1 1. So it's short positive using this count. Uh, question so far? I have a stupid question. Please. Um, why can't you have the, the one where the bottom's a one, and then just above it's a three, and then a five, and then like two, four? OK, so let's check our columns. Uh, 1, 3, 5, we're going from 1 to 3 to 5, we're non-decreasing. 2 to 4 is okay. If we look at rows, 1 going to 2, that's not a chain in this post set. 1 and 2 are incomparable. Okay. And I need them to be increasing with respect to I see. my okay. order. So, yeah, this one is not a chain, and also 3, 4 is not a chain. Great, thanks. Yep. Okay, so we're going to keep this in mind as we talk about our next thing. Um, okay, so symmetric function theorists in the room or on the viewership online are thinking, well, we know how to translate between different bases of symmetric functions. So we have an expansion in terms of the shear functions. Why don't we just take it and expand it in terms of the E basis? And the answer to that is we can and we will. but. It involves determinants, so it's objectively hard. <laughs> okay, so how you convert between Schur functions and elementary symmetric functions is called the dual uh, Jacobi Trudy identity. And it is as follows. So we're going to denote lambda prime as the conjugate of lambda. This is the partition you get by reflecting across the diagonal. That's why it's a dual, because we have to take a, a conjugate. Then S lambda conjugate is the determinant of this matrix. So. On the diagonal, we're going to put um, the sort of single term elementary symmetric functions for the first part of lambda, the second part of lambda, all the way down to the kth part of lambda. So, sorry, can I ask, where did you use the incomparability graph uh, in your calculation? Um, we, so that's the really nice thing. We never used the graph itself. Right, normally, or without this theorem uh, of Gosharov, if we wanted to calculate the chromatic symmetric function of this, we'd have to count all of the colorings and then group them up in terms of like share functions. But the theorem tells us that you don't actually have to look at the graph, you can just look at p tableau instead. And so we never actually used the graph when calculating these numbers. Uh, so uh, if I double check myself, so. Uh Something related to chromatic function with the coloring can be computed with that p tableau thing. Yep. So this point. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. So if your graph comes, if your graph comes as the incomparability graph of a POC set, then you can use this formula. Okay. If I just hand you an arbitrary graph and you don't know if it came from a POC set or not, then you'd have to, you know, do it manually. Okay. Um, or use Some people also study just claw-free graphs that avoid that claw, which is the incomparability graph of the three plus one. And I don't think it's the same set of graphs that is this incomparability graph of a 3 plus 1 for you, is that right? I think I it? agree with you. Yeah, I think it's like slightly different, but like there's some results about that too. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so some. I don't some, know which results are which, I don't have it memorized. There's a lot happening in this yeah. field. It's kind <laughs> yeah. of it's overwhelming sometimes. Yeah. Um, okay, 
So we want the determinant of this matrix. We're putting elementary symmetric fun functions on the diagonal. They're actually going to be all of the entries. In a row, as you go to the right, we're going to increase the index by 1. So e lambda 1 plus 1, e lambda 2, or lambda 1 plus 2, so on, all the way to e lambda 1 plus k. Minus 1. Uh, yep, thank you. Um, as we go to the left, we're going to subtract. So this is e lambda 2 minus 1. And if you ever have e subscript a negative number, uh, we just put a 0 there for convention. Um, so this would be like e lambda k minus 1, e lambda k minus k plus 1. Okay, and hopefully that's intuitive for how that fills out. Um, so let's look at that to turn the symmetric function we have over there into the E basis. Um, so our first partition is 2, 2, 1. So lambda prime is 2, 2, 1. So lambda is you know, the conjugate of that, or 3, 2. And so what we're going to get is s2, 2, 2, 1 is equal to the determinant of looking at these row lengths for this is my lambda 1, this is my lambda 2. So 2 by 2 matrix, not too bad. Um, so e lambda 1 is e3. If I add 1, I get an e4. Um, down here, we're going to, or on the diagonal, we're going to have an e2. And then to the left of that, an e1. Lambda 2 is 3 or 2? It's 2. Okay. I think I said 2 and wrote 3. Or maybe I said 3 and wrote 3. But it's 2. Thank you. Um, so it's the determinant of this matrix. And so it is going to be e3, 2 minus e4, uh, 1. When you multiply the elementaries with just an integer subscript, you make the partition formed by putting those parts together. All right, this is a little spooky, because we have a minus sign. But in this case, it'll all work out, and we'll have more positives than negatives. Um, OK, if we look at our next partition, 2, 1, 1, 1, we're going to be considering lambda equals 4, 1. So this is the determinant of e4, e5, e1, e0. And E0 is just 1, the degree 0 elementary symmetric function. Um, so this one is going to be E41 minus E5. And finally, if I have a column, that's just the determinant of E5, which is E5. So if we plug that and replace all of these share functions with elementary symmetric functions, we will get the following. Okay, so we have um, eight E32s. That doesn't show up in any of the other ones. We have uh, minus 8 e4 ones plus 14 of them, so we'll have 6 left over. And we have minus 14 e5s plus 24 e5s, so plus 10 left over. And everything worked out, and this is expanded positively in the elementary symmetric function basis. Sorry, did you say e positive implies s positive or the reverse? Um, e positive implies s positive. We know they're s positive. The open problem is that they're e-positive, so the converse of the statement. Oh, obviously. OK. I kind of forget that sometimes, too. Don't worry. Um, OK, 
So this is something that I learned about in a talk that Bruce Sagan gave recently, I guess last semester. Um, so I'll just summarize his result really quick. Um, the, the core idea of like how we can use this to study these things is we know how to expand the symmetric function in the shear basis. We have this determinant, determin, determinantal. What's the adjective form of determinant? I don't know. A thing relating to determinants to tell us how to turn an S into an E, but that gets really messy as your examples get larger and larger and larger, and it's you know hard to prove that a determinant gives you, you know, all of the things that cancel. But we can pick out a specific coefficient. So what Sagan and his um, collaborators' technique was was okay. Well, let's just pick one of the coefficients of the um, elementary polynomials, e sub n, so kind of the longest, or the, the column, elementary symmetric function, and prove that that one is positive. And so that is, in fact, what they did. So theorem, this is due to um, And it roughly says the following, sort of dumbed down for what we're doing today. Um, the coefficient of E sub n in this chromatic symmetric function is a non-negative integer. So one step towards proving that these symmetric functions are E positive. Um, the way they did it was noticing that in this determinantal formula, um, the only time you can get the symmetric function, or the, yeah, the elementary symmetric function E sub n is exactly when you have E to the n right here and a bunch of ones right off the diagonal. Um, and that only happens when your lambda is what we call a hook shape. So a big column with a row attached. So a single column in a single row. Um, then they used a sign reversing involution to show that these cancel whenever lambda is not um, specifically a column. and showed that the coefficient of e to the n is counting the number of column p tableau with a certain condition. And so once again, we're proving that this coefficient is counting something, so thus it must be a non-negative integer. So the work that I have been thinking about recently, like my board organization has been kind of jigsaw puzzly today, um, is, okay, take this result, and let's try to translate it back into the language of Hessenberg varieties and cohomology. So the goal, translate these ideas back to the cohomology of the Hessenberg variety. So given a Hessenberg vector, you can do all of the graph and the chromatic polynomial stuff, you can also form an algebraic variety called the Hessenberg variety. You can take its cohomology ring and represent it as a polynomial ring. Um, Tomasco showed that there is an action of the symmetric group on that polynomial ring. And when you take the Frobenius character of that, you get back to the chromatic symmetric function, which is how this whole thing turns into a nice circle. Um, but if we think about you know, these sort of certain column p tableau with certain properties, 
can we find a direct bijection to you know, certain monomials in our polynomial ring with certain properties? So that's sort of the current research goals of me. And that is where we're going to end stock. Yeah. Um, so when, when Martha talked about Hessenberg varieties, yes. she was looking at graphs coming from dip paths. Is that right? Yes. Are those a subset of POSET graphs, or these incompatibility graphs, or are they just two different types of graphs? They are the same. They're um, the same. So oh. there's, there's, a, there's like, I don't know, if it's personal preferences or what. Um, but there's lots of ways to think about a Hessenberg vector. Um, yeah. You could equivalently think about it as a dick path. Yeah. So, oh, what dick path would this be? Um, maybe go up two, go up to three, go up to five. Yeah, something like oh, that. Okay. Um, so these are in bijection with each other. Oh. And so you can yes. form graphs from this equivalent. Did I do this wrong? This oh, wrong I'm sorry. Screen? No, I, I uh, missed this two steps above the three. Is there's not an extra dot in the middle? Oh, yeah, 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 I was just confused. Yep, yeah, looks right. Yeah, so um, if your goal is to get from a Hessenberg vector to a graph as quickly as possible, the way I do it is the entries tell you where you stop having edges. So I have an edge from one to two, but nothing else, an edge from two to three, but nothing else, an edge from three to four and three to five, an edge from four to five, and that's it. I'm thinking about this as like H1, H2. That's my shortcut for drawing the graph. Cool. Um, and then I usually go from the graph back to the post -end. Right, equivalently, this is telling you what the element one is incomparable to. It's incomparable to two, but you can compare it to three four. Cool question. Any others? Yeah. Uh, this is just curiosity from your example. Um, when you wrote those particular S's in terms of E's, right, each one was like a positive E minus another E, mm -hmm. and they were sort of telescoping because you got a negative E, and then the next one had a positive E. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that this was E positive came from the fact that those coefficients are increasing. Yeah. Is there anything, is that just coincidence to this example, or is there I think that? that's probably because of the smallness of this example. OK. Like, um, talking about even like what it means for these coefficients to increase in general, you need to have some sort of nice ordering yeah, yeah, yeah. on your tableau. Uh -huh. um, and an ordering that's like compatible with this determinant, yeah. which I don't, I mean, no one has found yet, otherwise this problem would be solved, right? Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I think it's telling that they were only able to get so far to get them to cancel, like the negative signs to all cancel for like en, right? And in yeah. some cases, like e n minus one comma one, and like they're, they're still working on it, right? I mean, it's very hard to show that these negative signs all cancel. I guess the thing I swept under the rug is that they proved these for the um, quasi-symmetric, or the, not quasi-symmetric, yeah, the quasi-symmetric, chromatic quasi-symmetric function, um, which is where you include this T or Q parameter that's keeping track of some more information about your colorings, um, and then that T is where sort of things cancel using their sign reversing inflation, but it wasn't the most important thing to talk about today, so I didn't talk about it. It's also like worth pointing out that the um, there's actually sort of a geometric proof of the sure positivity as well. So we have the combinatorial coefficients, but just looking at that um, cohomology ring, uh, as long as there's a basically when you have a ring like this, as long as there's an SN action, right? And uh, Juliana Tomasco found the SN action on this that shows that it's sure positive. So, um, but but then there's like some ways to say if you understand this SN action well enough then we can show it's E positive too. Like, so that would be a way around the combinatorial approach, right? By try, instead of trying to get these negative signs to cancel, um, just understanding the geometry and the dot action better would also help us prove this conjecture. So, um, but that's, yeah, not, also not clear how to do. So, <laughs> yeah. so there's a lot of like really <clears throat> intense symmetric function theorists who are just looking at graphs and taking their symmetric functions and trying to prove things about them. There's lots of, you know, really, dedicated geometers who are deeply studying this cohomology ring. 
and trying to prove things about this dot action. And I've landed in the middle, and my work is going to be translated between the ideas. Cool. Yeah? Can I have a much more innocent question? Innocent? Like, yes. Yes. <laughs> I know that true positivity is, is important, TM. Sure. Because, you know, um, representation theory. But why is e-positivity important? What does it tell us? That's a good question. Um, so, let me say a couple things on that. The first thing is, ipso facto, the original conjecture was about e-positivity. I think Stanley just saw a pattern in some, like he came up with the chromatic symmetric function, was looking at some graphs, and found a pattern and made a conjecture. That's, I don't know if that's what happened, but that's what it feels like what happened. <laughs> um, but, so the Frobenius map on representations, um, if you have, you know, Sn acting on some vector space, or algebra, or whatever you want to call it. Right, the Frobenius image sends this to some symmetric function. In our case, when we're acting on the Hessenberg variety, this sends it to omega applied to the chromatic symmetric function. Um, oh gee, let's put some H's somewhere. Um, so really, E positivity of the symmetric function is H positivity of omega. And then saying something about this being H positive comes back and tells you, are they permutation? Is that the word? Permutation representations. Permutation representations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So not just, not only do we just have a representation of S on B, it is in particular a permutation representation. What does that mean? Yeah, That's a question for Maria. Oh. <laughs> Okay, I can explain this um, to you in a little bit and to give a summary, it's like when you have, so if it's like H mu, right, um, if, if, if it's like, so you have a partition, because each H also is an extra partition, that is the Frobenius character of a particular representation. It's, you know, one algebraic way is to say it's the induced representation from the Young subgroup with index mu to Sn of, of the, of the trivial on that. Or um, I like to think of it as you take a word of content mu. So if, mu, if you have mu1, mu2, mu3, you have mu1 ones. You write them down. Yeah. Write down mu2 two twos. Write down mu3 three threes. And you have that word, and you look at basically the Sn action on that word, meaning you're like commuting that word in all possible ways, and yeah. um, and understanding what that like where those are the basis elements of the representation. So um, that's, you know, when you think about the Mississippi problem in combinatorics, like how many ways can you rearrange Mississippi, um, you take like the length of Mississippi, which is 11, 11 factorial divided by like the factorials of all the individual letters. And it's like that sort of rearrangement action is the H mu, what that is the Frobenius character of. And I'm giving a sort of general hand wavy sort of explanation, but that's what a permutation representation is. So if we could show that this representation is always a permutation representation, an equally hard problem to studying the symmetric functions over there, um, then we would know that these are these are H positive and so these are E positive. So people like Mark Precup are like trying to dig into the geometry of the Hessenberg variety to find reasons that permutation representations will show up in the cohomology, right? Yeah, it's um, they they they've like found classes of them, and so they have like a partial expansion and whatever. Yeah. Good question. I hope I answered it. Yeah. Cool. All right. Let's think Kyle again. <laughs> <laughs>